Okay, good evening and welcome to our study on the book of Hebrews. We're at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and today we're going to read verses 1 through 15. I want to talk to you about two covenants and comparing those two covenants with each other. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, I'm just referring to it, you don't have to find it. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Paul tells us not to compare ourselves with each other. He says it's not wise. On the other hand, comparing different methods of operation can be very instructive. So we're, we're talking about comparing things and not people. In first and sorry, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 to 15, the author of Hebrews compared two covenants or two agreements between God and his people. We can learn many good lessons from this comparison. So in other words, we're not supposed to compare people and say, I'm better than you are, but we're supposed to compare things. And this is the two things that we're going to look at and compare with each other are the two covenants that go, or agreements that God has made with his people. Hebrews chapter 9. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room, there, w there were, uh, were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the jar or gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of, glo of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people uh, the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal covenant, or sorry, the eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? And let me read verse 15. 
For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So may God bless the reading of his word. We're talking about two different covenants. The first covenant was an imperfect covenant that was temporary. An imperfect and temporary covenant. And if you look in verse 1, it says it the introduction it gives us the introduction to the first covenant and it says that this first covenant had regulations for worship and it also had an earthly sanctuary then in verses 2 to 5 he deals with the earthly sanctuary and in verses 6 and 7 he deals with the regulations for worship let's look at verse 2 to 5 the arrangement of the earthly sanctuary and for this, you're going to need this little uh, picture that I gave you. Uh, this picture is an uh, outward picture of the tabernacle that was built in Moses' day. And under, on the bottom here, we have a description or kind of an, a floor plan, if you would, of the, what was inside. So if you go in by the altar, uh, altar of burnt offering on the east side there, you go in by the altar and then you go by the bronze laver, then you come to the first curtain. This line is a, actually a curtain and it's over here, okay? And uh, after you go inside that curtain, you see the table of shoe bread or show bread and you see the uh, golden lampstand, and you see the altar of incense. That is called the holy place, and that is the place where the priests would do their work on a regular basis. But then that second line in here was a second curtain, and it introduced the second room, and in that room was the Ark of the Covenant. And the high priest was the only one who could go into that second room. And the high priest could only go into that second room once a year. And he could only go into that second room once a year if he had blood with him. Otherwise, he would die. In fact, though there were such strict regulations about this second room that it was said that they would tie a rope onto the bottom of the high priest's leg so that if he did something that was not a, acceptable to God and he died, they would pull him out instead of going into that place to get killed themselves. Okay? So that is the old order, the old covenant that, that he is describing here. So verses 2 to 5, he says, the first room was called the holy place. And he says it had the lampstand, it had the table of consecrated bread. Then he says the second room was called the most holy place. It had the golden altar of incense. It had the gold-covered ark of the covenant. And this ark of the covenant contained the jar of manna. God preserved one jar of manna that throughout history, what would go with his people Israel. And it contained the rod that Aaron, uh, ha, of Aaron that had budded. Remember, they were going to see who had the authority to be a priest. And they had various people ha had these ro their rods and laid them on the table. And rod, uh, Aaron's rod budded to show God, for God to show them that Aaron was the one who he wanted to have that position. And then uh, this contained the stone tablets of the covenant. In other words, the second uh, tablets of the, of the Ten Commandments were in there. So all of this was inside this box called the Ark of the Covenant. Don't get this box mixed up 
with Noah's Ark. It has nothing to do with Noah's Ark. This box is, is a box with these special emblems in it that was a worship place for the people of Israel. And above the Ark of the Covenant, above this box, were the glorious cherubim. There was a, a kind of a I image or a, a carving of cherubim, angels, kind of going towards each other on top of the box. And they covered the, the mercy seat or the place where the blood would be sprinkled. So they overshadowed the atonement cover. And he says, I'm just giving this as a brief overview, a brief review of what you guys already know. He says, Those, that was the earthly tabernacle. And then he goes on to talk about the regulations for priestly worship. The priest entered the outer room on, reg on a regular basis. But only the high priest could enter the inner room. He would only enter this inner room once a year, and he could only enter it with blood. And he offered this blood for himself, because he was a sinner, and he offered this blood for the sins of the people. And it's interesting, the text says, the sins that the people committed in ignorance. Isn't that interesting? When we sin against God, very often we sin in ignorance. We don't realize how bad God thinks what we're doing is. So he was sacrificing for the sins of the people that they had committed in ignorance. So that's the, his review of the first covenant. It's imperfect and it's temporary. Now he makes application in verse 10 to, or 8 to 10. This is the application for Christians. The Holy Spirit was showing us something, verse 8. The way had not yet been made known. The way into the holy place would not be known as long as the tabernacle was still standing. Do you remember what the way was into the holy place? You need to remember what happened around Easter time. Around Easter time, when Jesus hung on the cross and he said it is finished, do you remember what happened? The, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And that was saying that when Jesus died, his blood opened the way for us to go into the most holy place. That means that, by the way, First Peter tells us that if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you are a priest in the family of God. So think of this. Now, because the, the way has been made open, you, you don't have to just stay in the first room. You don't have to just do your work. Because Jesus' blood has been shed on the cross, and because the curtain has been opened, you can go right into the Holy of Holies every day of your life. And you can go right into the Holy Holies and commune with God because, not your blood, but because of the blood of Jesus. So, the Holy Spirit was showing us something. He was showing us that the way into the most holy place at that time, when they had the tabernacle, at that time, the way into the holy place wasn't open. It was closed. Only the high priest could go in. But the way into the holy place would be closed or not be known as long as the tabernacle was still standing. Then verse 9, not only was the Holy Spirit showing us something, but this is an illustration for the present time. What is it? that gifts and sacrifices offered there 
could not clear the consciences of the worshipers. Just imagine, these people were constantly bringing animals to be sacrificed on the altar. And no matter how many uh, animals you brought, no matter how regular you were in making these sacrifices and having the priests make sacrifices for you, you still had this niggling inner concern. Yeah, there's an animal that had to die because I did it, but I still did it. And the people, their consciences were not completely clear. And the gifts uh, and sacrifices that they had given were external uh, regulations. They weren't internal healing that the people needed. So that was something to teach the people. And they, these, these uh, principles, these way, this way of doing things, applied until the time of the new order. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I think it was uh, George Bush the first uh, who talked about a new world order. And he was talking about how the way that America would relate to other countries would be different. Do you know who started the new world order? Jesus. Because this old order of sacrifices and the tabernacle and all of these things, that was God's old way of dealing with us. By the way, that's why our Bibles are called the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament deals with what the people did under the old order before Jesus died on the cross. The New Testament tells us how Jesus came and, and died on the cross and how God worked after Jesus died on the cross. So technically, only the Gospels deal a little bit with the old order, but after the end of the Gospels, in the, kind of the last quarter of all four Gospels, then you get into the New Covenant, and that continues through, through the rest of the New Testament. So that's why the Old Testament is called the Old Testament, because it talks about the old order, and the New Testament talks about the new order, the new way of doing things. So verses 11 to 15, the second covenant, con compared to the first one, the first one, remember, was imperfect and temporary. The second covenant is perfect and eternal. That's quite a difference, isn't it? Christ came as the high priest of the good things that were to come. And they are already here, he says. Jesus entered into a greater tabernacle. It is one, verse 11, that is not made with human hands. This tabernacle that the people went, went had part of their community when they were camping uh, out with Moses, every part of it was made by human hands. But when Jesus came, he, he was initiating a greater tabernacle, one that we haven't seen yet, but someday we will. One that is in heaven, one that is not made with human hands. It is not part of this creation. It's something that's in heaven. So Jesus entered a greater tabernacle. Second, Jesus entered, or, or entered with a greater sacrifice. Verse 12. He did not enter with the blood of animals. He entered with his own blood. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. That's why we me remember taking that cup of juice. Every time we take that cup of juice, we remember the blood that Jesus shed for us. 
Jesus did not enter with the blood of animals. He entered with his own blood. He did not enter just once a year. He entered once for all time. This is the amazing truth of Christianity. You don't have to get saved over and over and over again. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for everyone's sin everywhere throughout the world once for all time. That means no matter what you do, from the point of Jesus dying on the cross, no matter what happens after that, his sacrifice pays for everything. He pays for it all. That's how amazing Jesus' sacrifice was. He didn't need to enter once a year. He entered once for all. And he did not uh, obtain a temporary fix. He obtained an eternal redemption. You see how different it is? Then Jesus not only had entered a greater tabernacle and entered with a greater sacrifice, he achieved a greater result. Look at verses 13 and 14. He says, consider the old result. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sanctified them. That, that means that when they did these sacrifices, the people were set apart by God and God says, you did what I told you to do, so I'll forgive your sin. It sanctified them. They were outwardly clean. It looked like they were good people in upstanding relationship with God. But then he says, consider the new result. The blood of Christ, the eternal spirit, sanctifies us, and we are not outwardly clean, we are inwardly clean. God has a detergent that is supernatural. God doesn't only clean us up on the outside. He knows how to clean us up on the inside. Our conscience, our heart, that which relates to God. He knows how to clean us up on the inside. We are inwardly clean. Our consciences are clean. And because our consciences are clean we are able to serve God acceptably. Every time we try to serve God when we feel guilty, we don't really feel like serving God because we're not good enough. But when we come to God and he cleans us up and we are set free from our sin and we are cleansed in our consciences, then we can serve God with freedom. And then it says in verse 15, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. Not only did Christ come as the high priest of the good things to come, Christ is the one who made the covenant possible. Those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. God has made a promise. We, we know it in, in the most simple language from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now here comes the promise. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. When you believe in Jesus Christ, and what he did as a sacrifice on the cross, you have eternal life. You don't have to worry about ever losing it. You've got it. And that is the eternal redemption that he's talking about here. He says those who he died for are set free from their sins that they have committed and that were committed under the old covenant or the first covenant, all those uh, laws and all those rules and all those regulations that nobody could possibly uh, live up to. You just go back and read through the latter part of Exodus and through Leviticus 
and through numbers, and it'll overwhelm you. How could anybody ever live up to all these rules? Never mind remember all these rules. It would be impossible. It's overwhelming. <laughs> but because Jesus lived up to all those rules, and because Jesus is perfect, and because Jesus was willing to die on the cross in our place, and his innocent blood was shed for us, we can accept Jesus as our Savior, and all of our sins can be forgiven, and all of our misdeeds, all of our lack of living up to that Old Testament law can be totally wiped away because we're not going to heaven because of what I have done. We're going to heaven because of what Jesus did. So he's our, he's our hero in a sense. He's our savior. He's our Lord. So those who, who, for whom he died are set free from the sins that were committed under that first covenant. So now we come to the clincher. If the old covenant was imperfect and temporary, and if the New Testament or the new covenant is perfect and eternal, why would you want to go back to the old covenant? And remember who he's writing to. He's writing to people that a church that had many people who were not yet Christian. They were people who were close to becoming Christian. They were Hebrew people. That's why it's called Hebrews. And they were thinking, which is better? Is it better to, to become a Christian but if I became a Christian, I'd lose all my old way of living. I don't know if I want to become a Christian. Maybe I like those old sacrifices. Maybe I like those old offerings. Maybe I would miss them. I don't know if I want to leave them behind. But the author of Hebrews is telling them Jesus is greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Aaron. And this new covenant is greater than the Old Testament. And if it's so much better than the Old Te Covenant, why would you want to go back? And the key is, if these people would really understand what he was saying, they shouldn't go back. They shouldn't even want to go back. It's kind of like that song that we sing sometimes. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back no turning back because what I had before is nothing compared to what he has given me let's pray dear Lord thank you for the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant thank you that the old test old covenant was had a reason you wanted to teach us something through it but we realized that the Old Covenant was uh, temporary and it was imperfect. But we also realized through your word that the New Covenant is perfect and eternal. Help us to choose that which is perfect above that which is imperfect. Help us to choose that which is eternal above that which is temporary. Help us to choose Jesus and to follow him with hearts full of love for him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.